Hello, and welcome to the Astro Cody podcast. Today, we are joined by a very special guest, Professor Joanne Rhodes. Ms. Rhodes graduated from the University of Memphis with a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Bachelor's of Science in Physics. While an undergraduate UM student, she began doing basic physics research in the Department of Physics, which led to her first research publications. She has taught in the Department of Physics and the Department of Mathematics at several colleges and universities in Memphis and in St. Louis. She began teaching astronomy and conceptual physics at the University of Memphis in 2009. In 2016 she received an Excellence in Teaching Award given by the Briggs Foundation. She has developed an online course for Survey of Astronomy, as well as Astronomy 2. With an avid historical and current interest in the Department of Physics and Materials Science, she coordinated the 2012 University of Memphis Centennial Event for Physics, and the observance of the 50th anniversary of the Physics Department in 2016. She has been the lead organizer of the annual Lois McLaughlin Donaldson Endowed Lecture in Physics from 2016 to the present. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Joanne Rhodes. Welcome everyone to the Astro Cody podcast. I'm joined today by a very special guest, uh, Professor Joanne Rhodes, which, as you heard in the introduction, has quite the scientific experience and education. And uh, I just want to thank you for being here. Well, thank you. I'm happy to do it. Uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'd like to start. Uh, so have you been interested in science and physics all your life? Or is this something that kind of came on in high school or? Well, actually, that's that's an interesting thing to me um, because I was five, and um, I know that I've, I've I'm interested in when people do get interested in physics gotcha. or astronomy. <laughs> um, but I was five. I know Neil deGrasse Tyson was nine because I've heard him say that at a talk, <laughs> um, and some of my colleagues were seven or nine. So um, I think it's, it's great to talk to all ages. And I have talked to kindergartens. And, oh, wow. And they just, you know, they have the most questions. They all have their hands up. <laughs> very excited about the solar system. Anyway, the reason I got interested was because I got a bank shaped like the solar system. And I got that for opening a bank account. Oh, back, wow. back then, if they, they encouraged little kids to open bank accounts and um, they always gave them a gift. So I, I know that I had two bank accounts and I had two gifts. And one of them was this solar system bank and it said it was a plan it. Plan it. <laughs> oh, wow. So it. So, I mean, I, um, it, it had the sun about the size of a grapefruit and then all the planets, the whole thing from side to side is probably maybe a foot. Okay. <laughs> and, and all the balls were there for all the planets. <laughs> and I was interested that we lived on a ball, but nobody fell off the bottom. <laughs> I was really puzzled about that because that just was not what I experienced, you know, and of course we know that that's gravity. Um, so, but that, that got my attention. And when I tell my students about it, I say, and gravity is still one of the, the most amazing things that we experience and study because that's what's going on with black holes and gravity waves. And um, so it was just a small thing, but it's, it's kept my attention. I'll say that seeded into a bigger interest. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. yep. <laughs> and it's, it's funny you say that, like the younger kids, like, especially now, like how much, like there's access to astronomy things all over like internet, YouTube, you know, movies and TV, like there's so much that can pique interest now. And I, I mean, that's, that could be a good thing, but it also opens up, you know, to all sorts of other fields as well that kids can get into. Absolutely. I think when someone uh, gets interested in something at a young age, you know, it, doesn't always happen that it becomes a passion for life, but it can. 
And, right. um, you know, I'm, I love being able to teach astronomy. I didn't do my um, research in astronomy or astrophysics, um, but I have always loved it. And I just think it's great to be able to, to teach it and to um, meet lots of people that are doing research in astrophysics. Yeah. Now, when you first started out, what were your very first research publications about? Well, I had a double major. I was an electrical engineer and in physics, and those were two different colleges. Um, so I was always interested in physics, and um, I was I got a scholarship at the engineering college, and I and I took it. Um, but I just did all my electives in physics. So I was invited by my modern physics teacher to work in his lab. And he was um, going to um, include me on any publications. So I had two publications before I, oh, sorry, just oh, you're okay. <laughs> I've got a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, he invited me to, to work in his lab, and I had two publications by the time I graduated with my wow. um, undergrad degree, and it was in um, solid state physics. We were oh, studying, wow. We were studying crystals, um, calcium fluoride dipped with manganese. And then later, when I graduated, I, well, actually, I went. I went for the summer to NSA as a summer hire and wow. worked in optical signal processing there. And um, so when I graduated, I went back and I, I did optical signal processing research for a bit and I got a patent um, for uh, real time closed loop optical feedback system. And then I left, <laughs> I left there <laughs> and I went and changed back to my solid state physics. And I worked, um, I worked for the Navy doing radiation dosimetry research. Um, all the people that were on nuclear subs, for example, had to wear um, badges to detect whether they had been exposed to. Oh, wow. So we were, our group was, we were in the nuclear, we were the nuclear group. And wow. I did, I did, um, it was very much like I had done it in the graduate school, but it was just a little bit higher, <laughs> higher level. And we were, we worked with calcium fluoride doped with manganese, but we also did some other things. So those were thermoluminescent. Um, those were thermoluminescent crystals. So what happened is that radiation would damage the crystal. And then when you heated it up, light would come out. And the amount of light was proportional to the radiation exposure. Oh, wow. Yep. So that's, that was pretty much it. We were looking at different crystals and different doping um, I did a variety of things, and I know that my group moved into optically stimulated luminescence as well. Um, one thing I can say about all my research is that it all had to do with light. And that meant that I was always in the dark. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> We, we even had to put black tape over the power lights, you know. On because, really, yeah. Because if you're detecting light, you've got to make sure that what you're detecting is <laughs> it's true. Yeah, is what you want. Um, yeah. So I did that. I for ten years, I guess, and I decided that um, I would feel happier as a teacher because I was really a people person and gotcha very enthusiastic about um, things like astronomy and physics. And so 
um, I've been teaching ever since. Now, when you were talking about your, uh, the advanced optical signal, what, what is that in like layman's terms for, cause I know it was led to an optical adaptive filter. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, if you've, um, are you, um, uh, familiar with adaptive optics on telescopes? Uh, yes, actually. So I'm an astrophotographer. So what I kind of took from that is it'd be almost like narrow band filters, like imaging filters, that type of thing. Well, the thing is, is mine was not imaging. Okay. Um, it was communication signal. Oh, okay. But the idea, um, it has a kernel of the same idea. Okay. That, um, you've got a noisy signal. And you want to remove the noise as much as possible. Okay. And that's the adaptive optics in a telescope does that for the image. Okay. What I was doing um, was like for a communication signal that had noise, the, um, app, the uh, optical adaptive filter would predict, make a prediction. It's a linear prediction thing. It would make a prediction of the signal using past, like just, just a little bit of its past history, um, wow. predict it and then remove the noise. Okay. So, wow. Yeah, so that, that's what that was about. So it's uh, when I, years later, when I um, heard about adaptive optics for telescopes, I was really excited because, you know, I thought, gosh, it sounds a whole lot like what I gotcha. do, but it's not the same. It's not the same thing. It's not an image. And it's uh, certainly did, was not used for astronomy, but okay. the whole idea of having um, a real time way to remove noise in a signal is the same wow so it's like basically same idea just used in different ways yeah oh yeah wow. now off of that what made you go into the like the radiation dosimetry what made you venture into that was it there a crossover not really no not really but i it was what i had done in undergraduate school okay and um actually my um, professor that did the research at University of Memphis was consulting with the Navy near where I was living in Maryland. And I decided to just jump back into that. He was um, there as a consultant. And um, Dr. Jahan, who was our chair for many years, also, um, I saw him there as well so there was there was crossover with memphis is what it was wow okay yeah not not so much the uh communications part that i did at nsa wow that's pretty deep that you ventured into like nsa that type of work and then with the prior knowledge you went back to radiation and then now you're back to astronomy like so that's that's neat how you can bounce between different topics well <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I, I, it, it was good to have options. I, I, yeah, options. That's the word. Yeah. No, there's a picture that I saw going through your biography in the University of Memphis uh, with Neil deGrasse Tyson. What's the story on that? That is not much of a story. Really? <laughs> <laughs> that is not much of a story. I am a fan, but I have not, um, I don't, I am not connected to him. I wish I, you know, could say I could just call him <laughs> and talk about whatever, but I was, you know, I attended an event where he was speaking and um, was able to get a signed book and a photo. I did, um, I did show him, I had had a quote from him put on my iPad, engraved on my iPad. And, um, and he said, oh, I didn't start that. That was, you know, Carl Sagan said <laughs> that. And lots of other people said that. And I was like, yeah, I, I well. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> we are in this universe and this universe is in us. That was it. It's just that I heard him say it that way. Those exact gotcha. words. The general idea is, you know, not just his. And um, I still put it on my email. <laughs> <laughs> and I teach it, you know, I mean, I teach it. I teach it that we are in the universe and we're made of the same um, atoms and everything besides hydrogen and helium was made in the, in the center of a star. So we are stardust. And I, um, I, I think that people could, I, I just don't think people realize how um, amazing it is that we are here. And that's astronomy. It doesn't answer those questions. It actually makes you think of those questions more. Like that, it's such a big, like mind blowing idea of that. You know, it's, it's hard to grasp. And that's for like, that's what, like, I've loved astronomy since I was just a young kid, you know, had the planets hanging in my room and whatnot, you know, books and posters. And like, and then just recently, actually, with like the lockdowns, I got into astrophotography and it just started okay. with like my taking pictures through the eyepiece of a telescope with my iPhone. And now I'm into like dedicated astronomy cameras, things like that. And uh, it's, it's, it makes you ponder, like, how have I never thought about this before? Like, why am I just now thinking about it when it's such an amazing question? Like, well, it, it, it is, and it is, um, it's physics. And I like, you know, I talk about it in my physics classes as well. And it really has a lot to do with gravity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's Everything how it evolves back to gravity. <laughs> the gravity makes the, the gas, the, the plasma in a star, um, makes it collapse and heat up. Anyway, so we've, we've wandered around um, <laughs> on our topics, but all of it is stuff that I, you know, teach or <laughs> it's, have yeah. done. Yeah, in astronomy, you know, you you get to the part about planets and um there you go and earth is a planet and that it is, is a very yeah. special planet <laughs> yeah yeah it's kind of the only one we got right now you know? right i was telling them um that yes i know that people will go to mars and i know that we'll have a colony or a you know some kind of an outpost on mars but mars does not have what we um need to live the way that earth does gotcha. you can't just go out for a stroll <laughs> and it it doesn't have enough atmosphere to protect us from high energy radiation um, it doesn't have liquid water on the surface anymore and we think that's because the solar wind blew most of the atmosphere away after it cooled enough to lose its magnetic field that protected the atmosphere, but our planet still has a magnetic field that protects our atmosphere and protects us, you know, the atmosphere protects us from high energy radiation. That is something that we, we just don't have anything in our solar system that is anywhere like Earth. You can say that Mars has similarities and three billion years ago, it may have had, um, you know, the kind of atmosphere and magnetic field we have. It may have had life, but it's it's cooled off and things have changed. Gosh, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm for I'm for taking care of this planet. <laughs> I'm very excited about exploring Mars, though. And I, that was going to be one of my questions is what are your thoughts on like colonization of the solar system, like out to Mars and then, you know, perhaps even farther, like out to Pluto or anything like that. Like how, what's your thoughts on that? Well, um, I love what we learn when we venture that far. Um, and we've done a lot with, um, without manned missions. Um, and that doesn't put, life at risk. Um, gotcha. Of course, when you start having people go, and there are plenty of people that would be thrilled to go um, and stay and never come back. <laughs> I'm not one. <laughs> I'm not one of them. But um, 
yeah, I know that we probably will send people to Mars in my lifetime. Hopefully I'll be here and um, we'll learn a lot from doing that. There may be a colony that, you know, of people that will stay at some point. But again, just like there are people that stay in the space station, um, some people have stayed even a year. Um, that doesn't mean that it is, that it has the comforts of home. Oh, right. And that's, that's the way I feel about Mars, um, except, of course, it's not man-made like the space station. It's got a lot more space and it's got a lot more <laughs> Um, a lot more space a lot more to learn yes um there's so much that we could learn uh from being on mars but like i said it's um it's not going to replace earth um in my mind <laughs> so, and probably, yeah and you'd almost have to like have people that were born on mars to continue even further because it, like you said, it's hard to have people that know what Earth is like, know what it's like to just walk outside and see your neighbors in the blue sky and drive to the store. You know, there's 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 something that you can't get rid of when you leave, you know. That's true. I mean, if someone was born on Mars, they, they wouldn't know what they were missing, I guess. Right. Um, but yeah, it's the atmosphere is so thin and it is so cold and you know, people would definitely be enclosed in something, but I'm not an expert on how wonderful it can be made. Okay. <laughs> you know, if you live in a bubble, how nice can the bubble be? I am not, <laughs> I'm not an expert on that. Um, but, I, you know, I'm sure that people could go there and live. It just would not be like Earth. Right. And I, and I'm happy to stay. I just, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm happy to learn about the other places. I'm really, I'm really excited about Europa, um, because it's got more water than earth does under the ice. And there could be plenty of life in that water. We won't know until we go and look. So I think that's pretty cool. I've, and there actually, there is missions planned, I do believe, right, with NASA? Oh, and, uh, yeah, Europa is one of the, um, well, I don't know, I don't know a year or right. yeah. the name of, but I mean, it's been talked about a lot, um, that that would be one of the most interesting places to go to see if there's life because of all the water. We think that, uh, well, life as we know it requires liquid water. And you don't have open bodies of liquid water anywhere but Earth on the surface. But under the surface, under the surface of the ice on Europa and Enceladus, there's water. So who knows? Who knows what could be? It, yeah. And, and you, you know, just recently, uh, they found those different life forms underneath Antarctica, miles below that thick ice under there and they found life like what could possibly be in the, <laughs> like you said Europa like underneath that ice like if they can live here why can't it live there it's it's amazing life has been found uh in such extreme environments on earth it, it really is amazing and that that what you just mentioned is one of, <laughs> one of those <laughs> extreme environments absolutely now do you think humans like as a species now will ever go beyond the solar system out into the galaxy and do you think we will ever bump into another civilization that was doing the same thing whoa well i think it is quite unlikely that we will bump into anybody gotcha but <laughs> <laughs> um I don't, I certainly, I don't have um, evidence that there are other beings out there, but there are so many, 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 many stars and planets that 
I imagine that it's very likely that there are others that have been there um, or are there. But communicating with them and visiting with them is a complete, you know, that's a different question. Right. Because the speed of light is the speed of light. And, (laughs) you know, um, our galaxy is 100,000 light years across. And so uh, these distances are absolutely hard to imagine. They are very hard to imagine. So this actually brings me to the solar system model that we're going to be getting on the University of Memphis campus that I'm so excited about. Um, Because one of the things that I teach uh, in the first chapter of my astronomy class is perspective, trying to get a grasp of how big things are, Uh how, how big the distances are and that separate things. And it's, um, you know, I, I will get back to that in just a minute, but I know I'm really getting away from your question. Oh, no, no, no. I know that I, know that I did want to say one more thing. <laughs> um, yeah, there's, um, there's an idea to send tiny um, craft to um, our next closest, you know, our next star other than the sun. And accelerate those up high enough but then you have to you know decelerate them at the other end if they were gonna stop and look at much and send (laughs) the information back um but that i think it's called 100 year starship and um so that's not sending people but it is sending something that would help us learn more about um, other stars, other, other solar systems, but in particular, the one nearest us. So um, I think that's going to happen. And I think that the way it's designed, it can get there within a human lifetime. So um, those, it, I believe it's a whole bunch of little craft, uh, spacecraft, that so that if some of them get... Um, you know, if there's a problem and they don't all make it, that hopefully at least some will. Right. uh, I think that would be awesome. As far as physically going there, um, I don't know of a way to do that unless (laughs) we find a way to uh, have a wormhole there. (laughs) (laughs) And that's a crazy idea within itself. Yeah. 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 But what I was going to tell you about our nearest star, Alpha Centauri, is that in chapter one, we look at a scale model of the solar system where the sun is represented by a ball that's the size of a large grapefruit. And I had seen this model years ago. I think it's been there 20 years. And um, it's in front of the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian. Uh It's on the sidewalk. So you go out uh, the front door of the Air and Space Museum and you, if you look, there's just something to see in every direction. But (laughs) um, if you know to look, there's there's, uh, something representing the sun that is about the size of a grapefruit. And then it is a scale model. It has all the planets to scale size-wise, but also separation distance. And that's, you just don't usually get to see anything all on one scale. If you're looking at the outer planets, usually the inner planets are so tiny in the center of those orbits that, you know, you have a blow up um, illustration or something. But this, this is really um, amazing because it, it does have the actual, it's a 10 billion to one scale model. In every way, in every way. And so if I gave you a ballpoint pen and I said, the earth is about the size of the tip of that ballpoint pen compared to that grapefruit sized sun. That's not the way people picture earth (laughs) and the sun. And it's certainly not what was on my 
model my bank when I got <laughs> I got it at five. That is totally different. And then if I said, okay, now take that ballpoint pen. So you've got earth and walk away from the grapefruit representing the sun. How far do you think that you would walk before it was a scale, 10 billion, 10 billion to one, a scale, scale down distance? I don't, I mean, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have any idea? What would you guess? Oh, I, I have at least 20, 25 feet. Okay, so you're you're on top of it a lot more than I would, you know, than most people. Okay, right. <laughs> most people, most people, you know, they they see these little tabletop solar system models with all the planets, and that is just not reality. <laughs> um, it's a good teaching tool, but it's not reality. So the Earth is would be fifteen meters, oh. fifteen meters away. And it would just be that little bitty, <laughs> that little bitty size. Okay. So then the whole solar system would take 2,000 feet. Pluto would be, or 600 meters. Pluto would be 600 meters away from the sun. <laughs> and at the Air and Space Museum, you have to clock cross a street and go down uh, past the art galleries um, before you ever get to Pluto. Now that's impressive, but what's what's even more impressive is where would the next grapefruit-sized star be? If we said let's 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 take one and let it represent Alpha Centauri, where would that be? Oh, bet that's at least a mile, two miles. Okay, it's two thousand miles. <laughs> oh my God. It would be on the California coast from DC, from DC. If you say, okay, I've got the sun here in front of the Air and Space Museum. Where's Alpha Centauri? Let's use another ball to say, you know, and it's going to be in California. Oh, man. <laughs> Isn't that impressive? <laughs> I mean, it really helps people, it, yeah. you know, realize that things are big. Yeah. <laughs> things are big. And that's just our, you know, that's our nearest star. That's just the nearest star. So um, it's, it's, that's one reason I really am excited about getting this model because the people that made that one um, in front of the Air and Space Museum 20 years ago, they have made a, they have designed a lower cost model that opens it up more for uh, colleges and universities and um, communities to to get one, and um, they just released that in January, a uh, press release mid January about it. I oh. happened to be looking at my email <laughs> when I got <laughs> it, and I immediately called and emailed them. <laughs> so I was the first in the whole country <laughs> to say <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, finally. I, so, I've wanted one of those on campus for years. So no, is that going to be like a donation? Is that thing like um, a crowdfunding? Yeah, it's it's um it's not just crowdfunding. We have a crowdfunding um thing right now that your uncle donated to, which is how oh. this <laughs> all happened. He said, "I'm a meteor. I, I'm a no." He said, "I'm an asteroid donor." Yeah, we, <laughs> <laughs> we have stardust and asteroid and. <laughs> all the way up to the sun. Um, <laughs> oh, well, that's that cool. People, the different tiers. That's cool. Yeah, that people can donate, but also I'm applying for grants because oh, okay, it is a lot of money, and this is for the low cost version. So wow, um, the one in DC, if we got that one, it would be two hundred thousand. Wow, um, they're on stanchions that stick up high enough that from you know, it makes it easier to see them. Um, like if you're at the sun or you're, if you're at Saturn or something, and you want to see how far you are from the sun, you can see the stanchions sticking oh, up wow. and you can count back. And if it's a good straight line, you know, you, you can see, um, how far you've come. <laughs> um, 
each each one has a storyboard about whatever it is like if it's saturn or jupiter or whatever it's got color photos on this oval shaped storyboard and i think they're going to include a qr code so that you can look at film about it oh um, okay well that's that that's not on the original but i think that that's going to be um part of the new one and it's so it's the same size as the one in dc it the stanchions are just not as um uh big around the materials might be um a little bit different but it's got the same scale and the same separation distances all that so i just did the walk on our campus last week for the first time i haven't been on campus oh <laughs> yeah because of the pandemic <laughs> um but i did google earth photos to show where we would put the sun and they sent them back to me this is the um the the national center for space i i cannot oh, ever wow. remember all it's in let's see N-C-E-S-S-E, -S -S -E, I think, National Center for Education and Space, darn it, I'm sorry, <laughs> there's too many words, <laughs> there are too many words, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll pull it up on my computer and I can tell you, but anyway, that's where the design, the designers are, and they are, you know, in charge of the fabrication so oh, okay. my, my astronomy book author is actually the one that was behind the one in dc and i didn't even know that there's oh, pictures wow. of it in the book but i didn't know that it was his project and he had he's um he's got something called big kids science that um through that he is donating five thousand dollars to each of the first five entities that say they want this thing and oh, wow. um, and go through a certain number of steps and we're the first in the country to complete those steps and get awarded the five thousand dollars to help us so wow. right now we've got a little over twenty thousand and we're doing the crowdsourcing and we have matching funds for the first twenty thousand so that's where we're at um with the uh, with um, the whole thing, well, the, the it costs thirty seven five, but then with the shipping and the upgrades and the installation, it's sixty. So okay, <laughs> wow. So that's, that's pretty good. Everything. That's why I'm applying for grants. <laughs> I'm trying to get it, but we've gotten approval um, to to have it, with the caveat that we raise the money. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, so I'm very excited about that. Now, um, is this something that'll happen within this year? I thought so, <laughs> the, okay. but it has. It, it may be. It may be past the first of the year. Okay. Um, it may be spring. Even it may be even a year from now. But I hope it won't be as as long as that. Um, it requires that a total of five we'll get it together. So we've committed okay. to doing it, but they're not starting production until there's a group of five communities. Wow. Oh, so they don't like overproduce then? Well, it's, it's expense. It cuts the cost. Okay. The cost that they quoted is for, yeah, wow. <laughs> for a group of five. And if you, if you just want to get one all by yourself, it's dramatically much more expensive. God, now, are there other schools that you know of that are trying to get it as well? Yes, actually, the website for the national program, it's called the Voyage National Program. Um, it's at voyagesolarsystem.org. And if you go there and click on Community Network, it uh, says the next generation. And you go there and go to emerging sites. And there's 13, I believe. Um, let's see. The, let's see how many. There were 13 last time I checked. Jonesboro, Arkansas. 
is working on. Uh, these are all places that have done enough. They've done their Google Earth photos and an implementation plan. They haven't committed to getting it. We're the, oh, okay. Um, actually, I think Ocala, Florida just committed, if I'm correct. I think just in the past week, another one committed. But Ocala, Florida, Chalmette, Louisiana, Lake Charles, Louisiana, Traverse City, Michigan, Dover, New Hampshire, Roswell, New Mexico, Troy, New York, Youngstown, Ohio, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, wow. Watertown, South Dakota, Memphis, Tennessee, that's us, and mm. Brownsville, Texas. Those are the ones that are, we all have a web page on the national website. And if you go wow. there and look, it, you can see the Google Earth photos um, on each, on our, our page, and I'm assuming everybody else's, um, that shows where the sun will be on our campus and where all the planet orbits fall. Um, there's the, the inner planet view and the outer planet view, because like I said, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> there's two of them. So, because it's hard to see all of that, you know, in one picture. So we go out to the asteroids for the first picture and then we go, um, all the way on out to Pluto in the second one. And uh, yeah, it's exciting. Um, I did ask the national program director, um, Jeff Goldstein. I asked him if there was anything that simulates um, the speed of light because it would take a, over five hours for light to go from the sun to Pluto. Is there anything that you know, he can use to illustrate. He said an ant. <laughs> um, if an ant started at the sun and got to Pluto, which, you know, would be amazing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> on that too, if an ant went 2,000 feet, okay, walked 2,000 feet, it would be like um, an analogous um, situation is the speed of light. So light and the ant the light in the real case and the ant with the model would take <laughs> the uh, <Wow. laughs> fortunate, yeah, time. Wow. Yep, it's and, big. And, and would you, yeah. <laughs> what can I say? Astronomical it, means big for a reason. <laughs> yeah. And when you get like it's there's like you're saying there's a difference between looking at a scale in a book and actually being able to like walk in between it and see it and touch it and like it it kind of puts it more into perspective that it's real and it's not just like a drawing or a painting like it it makes it feel a little more physical. Yeah, you know, it's if people are excited because they think you're going to see really big planets, that is not what they're going to see because like. <laughs> Like I said, the sun is the size of a grapefruit. Everything else is smaller, <laughs> but there is a storyboard with pictures and all kinds of information about each thing. So it's still it's still going to have um, gotcha. the the images. But the point is how vast how vast our solar system is, and how amazing earth is that we even have that we are an oasis we are an oasis yeah. if you look if you look at that little dot the size of a ballpoint pen 15 meters from the sun and the whole thing the whole solar system takes 600 meters you know 600 meters 2,000 feet um and you think we're the only ones in our solar system that are anything like us. Earth is the only planet in our solar system that is anything like it. And just like Carl Sagan's um, pale blue dot, the picture, that's what it's about. That is what this is about. So the pale blue dot was taken by Voyager um, and then later, Cassini repeated it, looking at Earth from the perspective of Saturn. And it's just a little smudge. 
it's a tiny little blue smudge. And it's amazing to think of all that is on this planet and in this planet, all the amazing things. And, and it's just not like that anywhere else in our solar system. You're going to find things that it has in common with Mars. You're going to find things that it has, you know, in common with other terrestrial planets. But there is no place like Earth. And it's amazing that we are here. I mean, to me, it's. <laughs> I, yeah, there's no place like home. <laughs> there's no place like home. Click, click, click. Right? <laughs> click the heels. Um, I. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's, I think it's a perspective that people um, can benefit from to not only treasure our planet, but also be more realistic about um, what it would take to explore what it does take to explore our solar system, how far we're talking about going. Many people lump going to the moon and going to Mars in together, and they are. So the distance and the, you know, the amount of planning and everything that would have to go into going to Mars compared to going to the moon, it, that's an enormous difference. But I do think we'll do it. I mean, I, I, I'm very confident that we'll send people to Mars. But I don't want anyone to think I'm putting Mars down. It's just not Earth. <laughs> and it's nowhere near Earth. <laughs> it's nowhere near having what we have here um so i don't know that i i'm not i'm not knocking mars i'm just promoting earth and and giving a reality but you know a real perspective people can this is one thing it's also in my textbook neil degrasse tyson wrote the foreword and he put this in there he said some people think that they they feel really small when they learn about how big space is and it makes them feel insignificant. But he said, there's another way to look at it. And that is that you are connected to everything in the whole universe because we are made out of the same stuff. And it was made by stars from the gravity and the heat, the elements higher that are heavier than hydrogen and helium and a tiny bit of lithium. Everything was um, made in stars um, for, you know, with, uh, with the science, that's what scientific, our scientific understanding tells us. And gravity is right there. I mean, what the most important thing to know about a star is its mass because gravity can pull that mass towards the center, try to crush that mass. And that's what heats it up. And it has to be hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium. That's what makes the stars shine in the beginning. And as they run out of fuel, they start using the next thing that they've made. So if you run out of hydrogen, you use the helium, but it's a whole lot hotter to fuse helium. So gravity does it again if there's enough mass. And it's... You know, it's physics. It's just, it's just physics. <laughs> it's just physics. And, you know, it's, it's really amazing when I first realized that gravity can explain how we ended up with all the elements to where we even can have planets. Um, and it's not just hydrogen gas and helium gas. Um, it, it's just profound. And I like what Neil deGrasse Tyson said about that, that you can feel connected to everything. The most common elements in us are also the most common elements in the universe. We're in it and it is in us. It, it, we are in it and it is in us. That's why I love that quote, regardless of who I attribute it to. <laughs> it's like, oh no, that's not my quote. <laughs> Good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm definitely a fan. <laughs> I've seen him a couple times. Um, a couple. You know, 
going to hear him speak. Yeah. He's been at Memphis. Actually, I think I've seen him three times. Sorry about that. I went to Nashville and I think I've seen him in Memphis twice. So yeah, he does that, that circuit. And like, when you think about like Carl Sagan, like he was like, I'd say like your generation, it's like my parents' generation. Like that was, that was your guy. Like that was him. And now going to like my generation and like kids underneath me, like Neil deGrasse is the guy, you know, like he's, he's <laughs> kind of the new Sagan, like in a, in a way, you know, when it comes to like impressions and like, and um, being the face of like astronomy, like he's very, very engaging and he's brilliant. He's funny. Um, he knows how to reach people. Um, and I, I, I thought it was great that he had met Carl Sagan when he was looking at colleges. Um, and so they, they had their paths crossed and it means a lot to him that he had that connection. Um, he's actually my age. I'm a few months older than he is. Um, so I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, I don't think that there could have been a better choice for doing the Cosmos follow-up series. And there have been two after the original, um, but they're all good. They're all good. They're different. <laughs> He's different. But do. He is different than Carl Sagan and his, um, the Cosmos series have a different feel <clears throat> than Carl Sagan's, but they were all written. I don't know if you know this, you probably do. Carl Sagan's um, widow she was part, she helped write the original Cosmos with him, and she has written the next two. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah. So wow. there's a lot, there's a lot of connection um, and continuity, even though the hosts are different people and have different styles. They're both, they were both Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson. They're both excellent at engaging people and brilliant they're just they're both um seeing being able to put things together and show others what they see things that you would never have thought of um it's 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 wonderful to have um popular educators like that and i'm glad we've got i'm glad we've got them and there are more coming up all the time i'm sure it's um, right yeah you know, um, yeah, I'm about, I'm going to be 63 this next month, and he's going to be 63 in October. Oh, okay. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so young spring yeah. chickens. Huh? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right, 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 right. I don't think he'll mind that I gave away. Um, <laughs> hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think I tell my classes, I think this is a great time to be alive, astronomically speaking, because we have space telescopes, we have um, space travel, we have sent so many probes out in my lifetime, um, and we have learned about so many things, and there's so much on the horizon. I just want to know it all. I still want to be here. I, yeah. Know? I want to be here. And um, I just, you know, I hope I will be here for uh, a number of, I want to be here when we get to Europa. <laughs> yeah. Definitely Mars. Also Europa. And um, the space telescopes, the James Webb Space Telescope is supposed to launch on Halloween this year. I, I'm so excited for that. I know. I can't wait. <laughs> We had Matthew Greenhouse speak about it a couple of years ago on campus. He came from NASA Goddard to speak about it. And it was incredible. It was so, so exciting. And he had wonderful videos. There's so much you can find about that telescope online and everyone working together for that common, common goal to get that thing up and, um, placed and unfolded 
be. It takes two weeks to unfold it. Mm-hmm. I love that that they use, you know, they're inspired by origami um, to fold things up. You have to fold them up to get them in a rocket. That's and then when end. you get there, you have to <laughs> unfold everything and have it not get hurt. Um, it's just amazing. And they've been working on it for over 20 years. And it's large. Like it is very it is large. Huge. When you look at it the is, pictures compared to the workers next to it, it is large. Um, <laughs> I had um, a handout. Um, I went to see John Mather speak oh. at, a, at a different at a different uh, place in Memphis, Edwards Rhodes College, and um, he brought handouts that compared it to the Hubble, and it was amazing. Because it would show how big the Hubble telescope is and how big the James Webb telescope is. And then the Hubble is about 350 miles above Earth. The James Webb is going to be a million miles from Earth. Holy moly. It's a completely, (laughs) you know, like comparing the moon and Mars. I mean, it's. It's, Yeah. It's. (laughs) um. And it's 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 going to be able to do so many things, but it's wonderful to see them unfold the sun shield and unfold the mirrors. All of that is online. You can see it all. Um, and and I encourage you to. Um, also, we have a video of his talk that includes his videos <laughs> oh. on the physics website. So if you wanted to see that actual talk, you can go to the physics website. In Memphis, it's memphis.edu slash physics. And you can go, it's a, an endowed lecture. Um, it was given in memory of a woman named Lois McLaughlin Donaldson by her husband. And he endowed the lecture. So every year we can bring someone in that is an expert in their field in physics. And um, so far, we've had five, uh, we've had five astrophysicists. Oh wow! Um, yeah, we're very excited about <laughs> that. We just had Dr. Meg Yuri uh, from Yale last month. She came. Well, she didn't come and speak. She was going to come last year, but oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And so we did it on Zoom. We did it on Zoom this year. We weren't quite expert enough to do it on Zoom last year when it was canceled. Gotcha. But Matthew Matthew Greenhouse is the last one who actually came to campus. <laughs> anyway, all of our five, we've had five, and all of those are they're annual, and all five um, videos are on our website, physics website. And I will link that. I will link that too in the description too. So uh that our listeners can view that and then watch the lecture as well. Along, uh, is there a donation link that they can donate to the scale model? Yes, it's on our physics website on the front page. It sure is. So if you go to memphis.edu slash physics, you will see. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of you, you will see right it. Front. And it has the Google Earth photos um, right there. If you click on it or either photo, it takes you to the donation site and it includes um, a little three and a half minute video of me showing um, my model from age five, as well as an eclipse model that I use in class every semester for eclipses. And I show you how not to scale those. (laughs) (laughs) But very useful. <laughs> Still very useful. And yeah. Yeah. Anything's better than nothing. You know, like. Definitely. Um, I mean, and for for a kid, it was perfect. Uh, for yeah, me to get right. a solar system, you know, and it had the plane that the planets were embedded in. And <laughs> so I got the picture. I got the picture that it was a plane and that they went around the sun and it actually spins the the ecliptic plane spins on this particular thing and i've only seen one other one just like it ever in my life (laughs) i really enjoy having it but um pluto popped out at some point (laughs) (laughs) it's been wonderful it's been fun it's been a lot of fun i appreciate being invited i've not done a podcast before very, I listen to them, but I have not done them. So, 
you and good luck with your podcast and your astrophotography. Thank yeah, thank you. you so much for coming on. I appreciate your time. A huge thank you to Professor Rhodes for joining me on today's episode. Links to the scale model, lectures, and videos are in the description down below. See you all next time on the Astro Cody podcast.